Bonjour tout le monde. Je vous souhaite la bienvenue à l'Université d'Ottawa à l'occasion de notre événement d'aujourd'hui avec uh, Monsieur Thomas Carruthers. Um, welcome, great that you could all come. Um, my name is Gerd Schoenwalder. I'm a senior associate here at the Center for International Policy Studies, one of the co-organizers of this event together with Canada. And um, I'm very excited that we can kick off the fall term with such a distinguished speaker. But I do want to mention that there's plenty more in the pipeline. Um, we have a full slate of events coming up this term. And um, I do want to mention one that is particularly close to my heart, if you permit me a plug, namely a conference on democracy promotion and the emerging powers in the, the middle of October. So um, I want you to have a look at our website once you um, get out of this room. Mais maintenant, euh, avant de passer la parole à M. Paul Rose Edwards, qui va vous présenter M. Carruthers et le sujet de son discours d'aujourd'hui, je voulais vous, vous assurer que, après la présentation, ça serait possible de poser vos questions en français et aussi en anglais. Euh, la présentation euh, euh, elle-même va se faire en anglais. So, um, We'll have a presentation of about 35 minutes in English, but you can ask your questions in French as well. And for that, uh, let me hand over to uh, Paul Rose Edwards, who will introduce the speaker to you. Great. Thanks very much. Uh, so, hi, my name is Paul Rose Edwards. I'm the Executive Director of Canada uh, and your moderator for today. Uh, I want to thank Gerd Schoenwalder, uh, Isabel Carrar, uh, David Petrasic, Sips, U Ottawa for having collaborated with us on this one and providing such a lovely venue. Uh, those that are new to the building, uh, I love this building. I don't know if you noticed the five story or actually perhaps it's a six story living wall just outside. So I encourage you to walk around afterwards. It's a, it's a great building. Welcome to all of you. Uh, the response to today's event has been quite overwhelming. Well, we do have a great speaker with us today and, and uh, but also my colleagues, uh, uh, Alicia Todd and Mateusz Trzewowski, uh, took great initiative in inviting Tom up, and also in collaboration with SIPS in getting the word out about the event. But I also think that the timing has been perfect. I have a sense that uh, Canadians, you, feel strongly that Canada has a role, and I would say a responsibility, to advance democracy uh, and development internationally and feel that perhaps we haven't been doing all that much on the democracy side in the last little while. Canada recognized in Tom's book a timely exhortation to just get on with it and, in quote, politically smart ways. Uh, and so I want to set you a small task as you listen to Tom. What is Canada's niche? We may not be a big player in the democracy side so far, but we can be a smart player and we certainly have the resources to do it. And so I would encourage you to start formulating some uh, tightly focused short questions for Tom uh, after his talk to help drill down into what is Canada's niche in the democracy promotion side. Tom and his book, in it, and it's a great read, I know some of you uh, will know that already, uh, and the rest of you are about to find out. Uh, it, and by the way, we have uh, some extra books on sale afterwards, but Tom would be pleased to sign the books of those uh, that have brought them uh, with them. Tom, Thomas Carruthers is the Vice President of the Carnegie Endowment for Democracy, International Peace in Washington. He's also the director of their Democracy and Rule of Law program. Tom started his democracy uh, promotion work in the State Department uh, in collaboration with USAID and then for a while he practiced international law. He then uh, uh, worked with a variety of democracy promotion institutions including in the field uh, before joining Carnegie. Along the way he wrote six seminal books culminating in today's book. A man who has worked in and clearly knows of what he speaks. And so would you please join me in welcoming Tom Carruthers.
thank you very much, uh, Paul, for the welcome. And thanks to Canadem for the invitation to come to Ottawa to give this uh, talk and for other meetings and also to uh, the University of Ottawa for the warm welcome and the wonderful building and room and great atmosphere here. One of the puzzles of the field of democracy assistance or democracy support is its relationship to the much larger field of development assistance and development <laughs> support. It's been something of a puzzle, uh, so even a mystery to me over the last 20 to 25 years of watching these two communities work sometimes alongside each other, sometimes quite separately from each other, sometimes at odds, sometimes more comfortably. And I remember about 20 years ago, I was in Kazakhstan, one cold January, and I was in the hotel that night. I was there working with the parliament <clears throat> on a parliamentary project. And uh, we had repaired to the restaurant that evening. Uh, and a little group of us democracy people was sitting there. And the restaurant was completely deserted except for one other table of obviously Westerners and obviously probably assistance people. But we didn't know them or recognize them. And they looked at us and we looked at them. And finally, one of us went over and said, who are you guys? Um, and they were from the World Bank and consulting team, and they were there doing privatization work. And they said, what are you guys doing? We said, democracy in Kazakhstan. And they said, that's a bad idea. Um, why are you doing that? And we said, because, you know, fall of the Soviet Union, democracy. And they said, that's the last thing this country needs. This country needs a steady hand, get its economy fixed, and so forth. And that's what we're going to do. So why don't you just go home and come back in about 25 years and do what you have to do? And we said, you're going to do a privatization program that's going to create a whole bunch of new elites who are you know, entrenched and steal all the money in the process of that program because you're not being very political about it. And you're going to doom this country to a semi-authoritarian system. And if we come back in 25 years, it's going to be worse. That's the relationship between the two communities, as it has been in many places over the last 20 or 25 years. It's not a healthy relationship. And what I've tried to do in this book and what I'd like to talk about today is how the democracy and rights field fits into the development field, and to some extent, vice versa. Maybe a little different than you talk that you thought you might hear today, but I'm always happy to talk about current events, and we can talk about current challenges to the field. But I want to take you on a little bit of a, a tour of what's happened over the last 20 or 25 years, because I think, actually, this is a key issue, both for democracy work and for development work. The development field is haunted by a fear. It's haunted by the fear that despite all of the careful studies that we do, all of the experience on the ground, all of the learning efforts, that we're repeating the same ideas and the same mistakes over and over again over the last 50 years. And there's a puzzle in the development field. We're constantly learning. We're constantly trying new things and testing. Yet when you go back and look at the record of development work over the last 50 years, it's unmistakable that there's a tremendous repetition of ideas. You take a concept like participation. You can go back over the decades and find that idea surge forward in every decade as though it's a new idea. We should have participation in development, participatory development. And it's like a cork that comes back to the surface again and again. As my co-author, Diane de Gramont, who lives in Europe and couldn't be here with me today, and I, when we were writing the book, we used to play a game. She would send me an excerpt from a document from a development agency. And the subject line in her email to me would be, guess the decade. And I would have to guess whether this fragment was from the 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, 2000s, or this decade. Six decades. It was dispiritingly difficult. Uh, to figure out, often I would see a cutting-edge program on women's leaders at the local level in Bolivia, 1963. Um, <clears throat> and this problem of, in a sense, I put it, to put it more vividly, that we're in, the, we're in the waters of development and change, but we don't know whether these waters are a whirlpool or are they a river. That's the fear that haunts the development community. Are we simply cycling around or are we actually getting somewhere? In the last 10 or 20 years, the idea of politics has come on strong in the development field. You hear people in development organizations that didn't used to talk about politics talk now very explicitly about the need to take politics into account, to think politically, to act politically. As a British Minister for Development said back in the 2000s, politics, getting the politics right 
is central to development. Yet, I can tell you from experience, if you meet that minister and you listen to the speech and you say, oh, so does that mean your country's assistance is very political? He or she will say, no, no, that's not actually what I meant. We just have to get the politics right. And I'll say, but how do you do that without being political? Uh, this is a central conundrum. There's lots and lots of talk about politics and development, suffusing the development assistance community, but a tremendous amount of incoherence about what it really means in practice. <clears throat> this book is an attempt to unravel some of that confusion and I hope put a little bit more order into the subject. Now let me start by just clarifying what do we mean in the book by assistance being political? Because this is, as I said, the source of a lot of confusion. There are two ways in which assistance is always political, always has been, always will be. And that is first that many assistance actors, especially governments, inevitably have interests that underlie the assistance that they give. That's a fact, it's a fact of life. There's no, it's not a surprise that the United States gives more assistance to this country or that country than this other country because they happen to care about the geopolitical situation of that country and so forth. That's just a given. There are a few countries, and sometimes Canada, <clears throat> I think, is, is one of them, but not always, that you know, are able to carry out a certain amount of assistance free of geopolitical interests, but it's actually more the exception than the rule in the world. So in that sense, I would acknowledge, and I think most thinking people would, of course assistance in many cases is simply political because it's serving lots of interests. Assistance is also inevitably political because even though it may focus on an explicitly socioeconomic goal like privatization, that's a political choice in a society. Things that developmentalists treat as unquestionable values like better health care, a rational tax system, a coherent privatization system, are in our own societies intense areas of political debate. Nothing is more political in my country than debates over health care. Uh, unalloyed good it may be, but it's an intensely political subject. And so in that sense, okay, assistance is always political. There are other interests at work and socioeconomic issues are political. What we mean is something different. When we hear developmentalists talk about thinking and acting and being political, they're talking about two things that are different. One, the assistance world in the last 20 years has started to articulate explicitly political goals in the assistance, in which it says the goal of this particular assistance program is a political goal, usually put in some terms of democracy, rights, democratic governance, and so forth, but making explicit political goals in assistance. That's one way in which assistance has become political. And then the second way is through what we call political methods, which is politically smart assistance, which says this assistance is going to be based on a political understanding of the local context. It's going to enter into the socio-political fabric of that society and it is inevitably an actor in that fabric and will try to activate some actors, activate some processes, affect the actual socio-political life. In that sense, we're going to do aid in a politically smart way. So having political goals and being politically smart in your methods are both the ways in which people who talk about being political, this is what they mean. But they're often confused over the relationship between those two. You can have very political goals, but act in very politically non-smart ways or without any real political methods. You could go to a country, for example, and say, we think the legislature could work much better and we'd like to do a parliamentary strengthening program. But you could do so in an entirely politically naive way with no focus on political methods. You could go and do a local children's health program that's entirely apolitical in its goals, but be intensely political in your methods of working with the ministry, trying to get a coalition of actors and so forth. So what's confusing about this area first is separating out the big political issues of interests and the, the political nature of all objectives from the fact that what we mean is having political goals and political methods and then the confusion over the fact that you can have political goals without methods and so on. Now, let's go back to the foundations of the field of assistance. In the 1950s and 60s, when the modern field of development assistance was born, it was born on an apolitical foundation. And this is what we're still, in a sense, working away from these days, is that assistance was, in its initial conception, was aimed at being apolitical. And when you go back to the documents in the 1960s, or actually the entry of the World Bank in the 1950s into the developing world, and the major bilateral actors in the 1960s, there was an emphasis on apolitical goals, that this would be about poverty, it would be about economic growth. And at the time, the international context 
was that most developing countries were not very democratic and were becoming less democratic across the 1960s. And it was hard to have openly political goals because countries were headed in an authoritarian direction for the most part. It was the Cold War, and most Western aid actors didn't, they certainly had political goals in the Cold War, but they were being told, don't mess with our politics locally and don't play political games with your assistance. So there were strong pressures in that period to make aid very apolitical in its goals. And there was also an initial mindset in assistance to use apolitical methods. There was very much the belief, it was a bit naive, it reflected the idealism and inexperience of the time to think that an injection of capital into a newly developing country and injection of some technical knowledge, those would be the keys to development. Give them the capital, capital that they need, give them the technical knowledge, they will develop. And so neither of those were especially political methods. Some money, a few technical, sort of some technical know-how, you'll figure out how to develop. And so both in the goals and the methods of assistance throughout from the 1960s through the 1970s and 1980s, there was a tremendous sort of apolitical assumption about this work. And people explained it to people in other countries as being apolitical. They cultivated an apolitical language about the assistance. And they often denied the political nature of the assistance. No, no, no. Uh, we don't do that when it comes to politics. Suddenly, in the early 1990s, that story changed. And it changed remarkably quickly. Suddenly, in the first few years of the 1990s, almost all of the major aid actors began articulating political goals. Uh, in 1991, for example, uh, a strategy statement, or essentially a white paper by the US Agency for International Development said, quote, Political development is central to social and economic development. This was an agency which for 30 years had been denying any political role in its assistance, waking up and saying, oh, by the way, did I mention? Political development is central to socioeconomic development. And in the charming way that official agencies have of putting forward a new policy with no explanation to what happened to all those other years when you're doing something completely different, it's presented as entirely self-evident. Starting from today, this is the policy and this is the knowledge. And all of the major aid agencies did that. Suddenly they were all saying governance, democratic governance, human rights, participation, rule of law. There was a swirl of terms that quickly became adopted within the assistance community that seemed related to each other, but actually, as I'll talk about, represented various different things. Why did this happen? Why was there this door opening to politics? It happened because for two very different reasons, and this is often confused by people that they don't see the two different reasons and the relationship between them. One reason was because of the international context of the times, the end of the Cold War, and suddenly the greatest spread of democracy in world history in those years, in the early 1990s, of course, the fall of the Berlin Wall, democratization in sub-Saharan Africa, continuing in Latin America, parts of Asia, and so forth. And the world was different. The world was changing. It seemed to be becoming democratic. And if you were an aid agency, you needed to get on that train. You needed to be responsive. This is what people were talking about in this world. This was the wind of, of, of history. So there was the obvious change in the context, which also, with the end of the Cold War, lowered the barriers to sort of political intrusiveness and concerns about sovereignty, at least in some places. You could arrive in another country and say, we're here to work on political issues without them saying, oh, this is a Cold War game between you and the Soviet Union, or the Soviet Union and you. You could say, no, this is, this is a new era. This is the era of globalization of values. This is the area where democracy becomes accepted everywhere. So it was different terms. That was one reason. The second reason was very different. <clears throat> a number of developmentalists in the 1980s had begun accumulating concern, particularly in their work in sub-Saharan Africa, but in other parts of the developing world, that at the core of the problem of poverty and lack of sustained growth was a problem of governance, that states were not performing the way that they should. And in 1989, before the fall of the Berlin Wall, before the sudden rush of this new thinking, the World Bank had issued a very influential report on Africa called, I can't remember the exact title, to sustainable growth, governance. <clears throat> that governance was actually the problem. And this was the, the economists reaching the state, reaching the issue of governance through their own experience in developing countries of frustration with injecting capital and injecting knowledge and finding the change wasn't occurring. They had reached the realization that politics was crucial. 
But being a political institution, they couldn't call it politics. They called it governance. Um, but it was a, a way of talking about the actions of the state, the relations of state to citizens, about politics, about power, and so forth. And so what you had in these early years at the end of the Cold War was you had an international context that was pushing many actors to embrace political ideas and political goals. And then you had some thinking about development that had changed that had caused a number of developmentalists to say, yeah, we should be working on these political things, but for very different reasons. These people over here were doing so out of an intrinsic belief that these are good things. And if you pushed a democracy promoter in the early 1990s and said, Paul, you're out there in the world hawking this democracy. Are you sure that's going to lead to wealthier societies? He would have said, oh, yeah, I think it definitely. It's a good thing for everybody. Democracy is a good, trust me, it'll get you there. Uh, I'm not quite sure what the relationship between democracy and economic development is, but it's a good thing. The, develop, the democracy crowd was not very informed about socioeconomic development and not all that interested in it in some ways. They were, they were focused on democracy and rights. The developmentalists who derived this governance conception, they were not interested in the intrinsic value of this governance or that governance. They just said this is the tool to get the kind of socioeconomic growth we think we need. So we're doing this for instrumental reasons. And if you show me a different kind of governance that's good for socioeconomic growth, then I'll promote that. You know, I'm just trying to get to socioeconomic growth and socioeconomic, <clears throat> you know, uh, reduction of harm. So you had, but they sat in rooms together and they began having meetings and issuing strategy statements saying governance, democracy, rights all go together, but it was two very different impulses. Now, and actually three in the sense that democracy and rights became somewhat different, a rights community and a democracy community, which is a, another long story and an interesting one, but there were really separate streams there as well. Now, what happened to this changed context over the last 20 years? It looked like a fusion was starting to occur of the traditionally separate areas. Has that occurred? In some ways, it has. There has been the establishment of a whole set of democracy, rights, and governance programs that almost every major aid agency or foreign ministry engaged in aid or major private foundation and so forth. Almost everyone is doing democracy rights and governance work in some way. It represents, roughly speaking, about 10 to 15 percent of the international assistance field now, which is small compared to still health and certain other programs, but you know, it's a large amount of money is being spent on this field. And there are programs in almost every country struggling with political transition or political change. If you go to that country, you will find lots and lots of uh, foreign funded or foreign people there working on political process, civil society development, governance, and so forth. So there is a big body <coughs> of change in that regard, a big set of assistance. And assistance providers have been trying to use political selectivity or conditionality in some places and saying, we'll give our assistance more to countries that follow a certain kind of political path. And so if this country has bad elections, we might reduce assistance or when we, a Scandinavian country, are reducing the number of countries we give assistance from, from 40 to 20, we're going to use as a criterion the degree of adherence to democratic values and so forth. Interestingly, as the 20 years have evolved in all of these programs, these initial streams, democracy, governance, and rights, have started to coalesce around a set of principles that they all seem to share and which have become a kind of common platform. What are those four? There are really four principles. Actually, I call them the four magic words of development. If you take me into any aid organization tomorrow and say, you need to make these people happy, say some things that will make them smile and nod, all I have to do is walk in and say, here's what I, here's what I think is important in the world. Participation, accountability, transparency, and inclusion. Heads will nod. Trust me, people will smile. Um, the governance people in the room will think, ah, oh, yeah, those are the, that's the kind of principles of governance that we're looking for. That's what we mean by good governance. We mean it to be participatory, transparent, inclusive, so forth. And I like those words because they don't have any ideology to them. They're not democracy. I can go to China and talk about, of course you want your government to be more accountable to your people. Pretty hard for a group of officials to say, no, we don't want our government to be accountable to its people. Like, we had to argue about what accountability means and how you do it, but pretty hard to disagree with that. Whereas if I go to the Chinese and say, we want you to be democratic, then we don't have a good time. Um, the democracy people in the room 
hear these four words, participation, transparency, kind of community, they hear them and think, that's good. These are the stalking horses of democracy. As long as they agree to these, they're doomed. Um, because once they agree to these principles, then we'll show them what we really mean. Um, is how could you have accountability unless people get to actually vote out of government or say that we don't like it? You've got to have free expression and maybe political choice. And these are, don't worry, they don't sound democratic, but they will be. The rights people in the room, they also love these four words. They say, huh, funny, you just described the rights-based approach to development. That's what it's all about, these four principles, because these are the key sort of rights-based ideas. And so what's interesting is the different impulses in the early 1990s have converged around these concepts for, I think for good reasons, but also because a community that doesn't always know what it's doing is quite heterogeneous and doesn't always agree with itself needs concepts that it can sort of gravitate towards and agree on. It's not a bad thing, but the danger often is it's a superficial level of agreement or understanding that doesn't really get to the differences below. Come back to that. <clears throat> Second thing that's happened, so one thing that's happened over the last 20 years, there has been a movement towards political goals and the embrace of political goals and these principles. The other thing that's happened is there has been an evolution in political methods towards more politically informed methods. Because what happened was, once in the early 1990s, or in the 1990s, once aid actors began working in countries and saying, we really would like to help change the functioning of your state institutions, uh, their first instinct was to carry out politically not very informed programs. We'll train all of your judges. We'll provide software for your courts. We will give your parliament new microphones. That's not a joke, it's a program in Nepal. Um, <clears throat> we will do these things and that will change your institutions. They tried that for five or 10 years and discovered that giving new microphones to the Nepalese parliament didn't really change the Nepalese parliament all that much. People had to sit up straighter because the microphones were tall German microphones and so it's harder for parliamentarians to slouch down in their chairs, but didn't really change the actual patronage system on which the parliament was based. <clears throat> and so, people began to discover these institutions are rooted in political problems which we'd better understand if we're gonna actually stop wasting money on institutional programs which are simply bouncing off of not very compatible foreign realities. And what you see in the early 2000s was a sort of breakthrough of we need to do political analysis for development work. And the first big breakthrough was the drivers of change work and Sue Unsworth, a British developmentalist, very, I think, very wise person, had this idea of why doesn't DFID, the UK Department for International Development, carry out a series of studies of what are really the drivers of change in this society, as opposed to saying this is where the society is or this is where it was, just what, what's moving and why and how could we be part of that process. And this unleashed across the development community a wave of interest in political economy analyses, as they're called, which try to understand the political underpinnings of developmental change. The Swedes called it power analysis. The Dutch came up with a long acronym that sounds like uh, sluguma or something, sounds like a Dutch word. Um, and the Norwegians came up with context analysis. There were different terms, but they were all suddenly saying, as a smart developmentalist, I need to get into the political fabric of the society and understand. It. A, that's the start of a more political method. And then they began saying, wait a minute, just working with the government institutions, there's no impetus for reform there. I need to work with directly with the citizens. And there was this enormous opening in the last 15 years on the part of traditional development agencies to then work directly with civil society groups or bottom-up groups or grassroots groups, whatever the name they appended to it was. And there was a tremendous shift in funding so that, for example, 25% of Dutch assistance funding now doesn't go to governments but goes to non-governmental sectors and organizations. And it was called by the World Bank and others demand for reform. No reform over here? Okay, we'll go work with these people to cultivate demand for reform that's gonna push against you. This was a much more political approach. Initially, it was done in a kind of technocratic fashion. We'll find people who are anti-corruption groups and this and that. But as you begin to do this more and more, you're into political waters because you're basically starting to try to change the balance of power in the society between the people who are not being well-governed and the people who have the power. And so developmentalists found themselves in much more political waters and needing political methods as a result. So to some extent, that's where we are. And to some extent, it sounds like we've made a lot of progress and 
it's potentially a revolution in development assistance because it takes on political goals, it takes on political methods, it pushes away the apolitical foundation. But the book that Paul mentioned is called The Almost Revolution. It's called The Almost Revolution because we're not really there yet, actually. We've had the insights, we've started to act upon them, a lot of change has occurred, but there are a series of reasons why we're not really there yet. <clears throat> Let me just go through them briefly. The first is, comes back to one of the initial points I made. Despite trying to have political goals and be politically smart, it is true that our assistance is locked into political interests that sometimes undercut these. I guess I feel this especially strongly because I live in Washington. So earlier this year, I had to read headlines in the paper after 10 years of rule of law programs in Afghanistan and governance work, I had to read about how uh, the United States government has been handing bags of cash to the government of Afghanistan in an entirely unaccountable and unrule of law fashion. At the same time, it's promoting rule of law programs in the same country. And so you can be politically smart over here, but if the larger political framework of your assistance isn't consistent with that, then you're being pulled underwater as you're trying to swim. So political interests still undercut this, but not in all cases, but in some cases. Secondly, remember I said that there were both intrinsic and instrumental rationales for being more political. What's been striking to me is that the embrace of the intrinsic rationale, Paul's belief that we should just do this, it's good, it's a good thing to do, trust me, that has not been embraced by many mainstream development developmentalists. The development community remains a community that is, our focus is on poverty, and I'm sure those are nice intrinsic values, but that's not what development work is about. And it's still the case that many development agencies feel torn between an intrinsic agenda that they recognize the value of, but they don't feel that's what the point of development work is. It's still quite a big issue. And secondly, that instrumental rationale is in question. Is it really the case that a more democratic and rights-respecting government will develop better socioeconomically than another one? We wish it were so. There's some evidence, the book last year, Why Nations Fail by Asimoglu and Robinson, a very important book, made the argument that inclusive institutions are good for development. The fact that such a book was being published only 20 years after we went out and started telling the world, trust me, it's gonna work, we're still arguing about it. We're still writing books trying to figure out and the Chinese government is still saying, uh, working pretty well over here, thank you. At least in some ways, we've pulled 400 million people out of poverty without inclusive institutions. And so there is still a fundamental argument about the instrumental rationale. We, we sort of embrace the instrumental rationale out of faith, and now we're having to test that faith against a rather messy empirical reality. <clears throat> Third, the development community has a number of entrenched bureaucratic needs and habits that work against politically smart methods. If I say to an aid provider, of course you wanna be politically nimble, or nimble, smart, adapting to local circumstances, a learning institution, all of those things. Well, of course, of course, that's us. We're, we're smart, we're nimble, we're flexible, we're attuned to local circumstances. And then I'd say, well, wait a minute, let's look at the sort of bureaucratic structures by which assistance is given. You have large front-loaded program projects which have to be developed and then are frozen into place. You can't work very easily with local personnel because of these rules and that rules, and so forth. There's a whole series of elements of how the assistance world still works in many cases that cut against the needs for very flexible uh, kinds of assistance and experimental and learning and so forth. Particularly, the pressure for results, which has become a fever in the assistance world. If I go to a donor capital, in addition to saying the four magic words, the other thing that's gonna make them happy if I say I have a magic formula right here for measuring results. Everyone will go, oh, give it to me, you know, I need it. Uh, I need to measure those results. Can you prove impact? Um, it's just a desperate need. Why, why do we have this fever, by the way? We have this fever because of loss of public confidence over the last 20 years in the assistance business and the difficulty of justifying to taxpayers at times of fiscal austerity in the West that we should keep spending this money. And so there's a, a pressure to justify the money. Um, and the results pressure, unfortunately, often works against politically smart methods. Because a politically smart method, you say, in order to do this project, I'm gonna have to spend six months and some money invest in a, law, a deep political study. Say, no, come on, impact. Get going tomorrow, get this project underway. Don't spend a lot of time studying. Come on, get to work. 
Um, or I say, I might need to do this for a year and then change gears because I've learned that's not going to work. I'll do this instead. They say, no, clear objectives. I need to measure this. You can't just change halfway through what you said you were going to do. That's cheating. Um, and so all of the pressures on results are working against the things that we've learned about how to make projects effective on the ground. And there's a tremendous tension in the aid community between the learning in one area and the pressure they're feeling in another. And, and two final reasons why we're not there yet, and the next one is in some ways the most important, is on the recipient side, the countries that are receiving assistance, there is a tremendous ambivalence, skepticism, suspicion, and hostility about this agenda. They're saying to themselves, you embrace these political goals, why did you do this exactly? What, whose interests are these political goals supposed to be serving? Were we part of that conversation when you announced you came to our country and said, if we don't have free and fair elections, you're going to cut off our aid? Were we part of that discussion? Um, politically smart methods. You need to study us. You need to get more into our what? Our fabric? Our fabric? What's that exactly? You need to get inside our society and be more of a player. Is that, do we really want that? And the conversation about assistance that used to be organized around the idea of you come to our country, stay out of politics and give the money to governments has been changed. We're saying we come to your country, we're going to talk all about politics and we're not going to give the money to governments, we're going to give it to all kinds of people, is deeply unsettling to a set of recipient societies that are deeply skeptical both about the interests of the West generally and about the wisdom of the West. They say, no, wait a minute. Political financing is so well run in your society that you're going to tell us how to handle political financing in our society and any series of issues politically which the wind of history in the early 1990s that empowered many people to go out and say, we, we have an answer politically. It's a lot harder today, 20 years down the road, to arrive in another society and say, guess what? I'm from a, quote, established democracy. I've got answers. There are a few places left. Maybe we'll talk about Canada's niche. But I can tell you, coming from the US, it's harder to have a credible pose in such a role than it used to be. And the final reason we're not there yet is the basic deeper structure of international politics has changed. There are more models on offer in the world now. You arrive in a country as an assistance actor, there are other assistance actors in the country. They may be from uh, Gulf monarchies, they may be from China, they may be from Malaysia, they may be from Brazil. They have all different ideas about how development happens, the importance of politics, the role, and they offer their money on different terms, they offer different kinds of programs. I think that's a good thing, basically. Competition, heterogeneity are good. But it undercuts, if we're there, Western organizations saying, you have to follow this political path or do things this way. They say, you know, I have choices. Tell me about the attractiveness of your, your path, and then let me think about the choices. The world has changed profoundly. And so, in a sense, the deeper contradiction is it's taken us 50 years to get where I think we should be, which is to start to really incorporate politics into our socioeconomic thinking about development. But in the time that it took us to get there, the underlying conditions for being in a position of strength have eroded significantly. So that's why where we are is, A, it's extremely crucial, I think, to get our thinking organized, to get clear what we mean, <coughs> to figure out how to do it, and secondly, to be persuasive with people in other places about it. This is our last chance to get the assistance equation, in a sense, right. And the assistance equation isn't just assistance, it's our relationship to these other parts of the world. And so the almost revolution is the attempt, what I've done in this book, is to set out a plea for, we headed down a good road. Let's see if we can get serious and get the rest of the way there. Hope that's helpful to you. Look forward to your questions and comments. <laughs> So our sound expert's going to come down and turn on the mics uh, for Tom. Uh, and, uh, but also, we're now going to handle a number of questions from you. Procedurally, the way we're going to do it is we're going to take four questions, and then we'll take a break, and, and Tom will uh, uh, answer them in a collectively, so to speak. En français, si vous voulez, Tom va le comprendre, mais il va répondre de façon bilingue, soit en anglais. Uh, and so, if you can, uh, I would encourage you, uh, you can see uh, there's a bit of a theme here, uh, I would have your questions help them to drill down and, and us to drill down into, okay, so what do we do as Canadians? What, how, how are we going to have an impact out there? Uh, how are we going to make something happen?
um, there is a sense of uh, skepticism. People don't believe anymore to AIDS and to the Western world because all the policy that uh, we are producing does not work, especially in Africa. And I'm saying from a real and concrete case. The case I want to talk about is about the failure of the model that you have said in the Democratic Republic of Congo. How can you is, uh, uh, express, how can you justify that more than a decade, uh, the United Nations has deployed uh, the biggest deployment in that country to seize the war and bring um, good governance, especially. It doesn't work. More than 10 years. The eastern part of Congo has become a country or a part of where you find all the non-profit organizations in the world. They have the money. Why? They say, we don't have a good government in Congo and we don't trust the government in Congo. They might be right, but what they are doing to bring that government in place, failure, nothing. The United uh, Nations has the biggest, most biggest deployment of personnel. And what they are doing now is they become uh, um, useless, I would say. No democracy, no development. But on the ground, you will see, especially in the town of Goma, all the non-profit organizations in the world there with a lot of money. How they can change this? That is my question, and uh, I would like to hear from you. Thank you. How can we do it differently? Thank you, Reverend Bologna. I'll try to keep it short. Um, so your book addresses the integration of local stakeholder communities um, in the design and execution of democracy aid projects, as well as the political goals. We talked about inclusion, kind of one of those four key words that everybody loves. Um, and politically smart methods, we talked about transfers of ownership, what have you. Um, and so my question relates more specifically to expand upon that section of your book, which I love, um, on, on youth mainstream uh, of democracy aid programming in the context of uh, a demographic youth bulge that's occurring in much of the global south, uh, but also of a disengagement of youth from political, uh, traditional, and democratic institutions across the world. Um, to what extent is that challenged, or, or to what extent are our democratic participation and engagement of youth emerging as uh, key goals or objectives of democracy aid programming at the national uh, and multilateral level? Because there's a lot of discussion now about the post-2015 Millennium Development Goal uh, agenda. Um, and, and perhaps a related question, since we're trying to be really concrete here and talk about how Canada can move forward uh, constructively in this direction, is what sort of a niche or, or, or particular resource might Canada be able to leverage in, 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 in being at the forefront of engaging youth more uh, in democracy around the world? Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Um, I've been doing um, public administration reform, rule of law, and so on. Um, with DPKO in Kosovo, UNDP in Afghanistan, and others. And um, uh, I've had the same experience that you described. And I, I want to ask something about international assistance providers as learning organizations, or not. Um, because what you've described, which corresponds with my experience, is learning from mistakes. And you. From my experience in executive education, you can learn more from successes. But we, we, have, we have not been doing that in, in the organizations that I've been working in. And possibly it's because the, um, the evolution of the discipline of uh, governance within international development, you have organizations, take the UNDP example. When I started doing this kind of work, UNDP said, we're not in governance because that's a matter of national sovereignty. Now they claim that governance is over 50% of their, of their work, of their mandate. It's inherent to
to their development work. And so you have organizations which are therefore staffed, like every organization, government and corporations, by people who are good at what they used to do. And you're asking, and you're asking them to do something new. Now the thing about learning from successes is, those people have very little experience working in countries that, where there is doing governance in countries that have good governance, like Canada. For example, in the field of participatory democracy. So you have people who grew up digging ditches, uh, irrigation ditches, who are saying, we're going to promote participatory democracy. But they've never lived, worked in an administration like Canada that practices uh, participatory democracy. So I wanted to ask you um, whether, I mean, what do you think, whether you think that you know, these, these assistant providers can become the kind of learning organizations that can do the development work of tomorrow instead of puzzling over the mistakes of yesterday? Great. Now, you're going to be first on the next tranche, uh, so we'll take four more questions. What can be done to reduce the contribution? An important thing to note is the contradiction when you give assistance for one reason while you're giving assistance for another, or you have, in a sense, contradictory goals. The assistance that you give for not very developmental reasons usually doesn't work very well. Um, if you look at, say, U.S. assistance to Pakistan over the last 10 years. The United States has given very large amounts of assistance to Pakistan because of various security goals. And that hasn't led either to a very productive relationship between the U.S. and the Pakistani government or towards very much governance change in Pakistan. And so it's actually surprisingly rare that the assistance you give for other reasons does very much for you, in my opinion. I think it's greatly overrated what it does for you in most cases. It's, oh, we've seen that very vividly in the last two and a half years. The United States has been supporting the Egyptian military for quite a long time, substantial amounts. But ever since January 2011, the United States at periodic intervals since then has tried to exert some kinds of political influence over that military and come up empty handed. And all of those years of that close relationship, all those tens of trillions of dollars, and that special relationship that was created when push came to show. What is there to show for? And so I think one needs to take a hard look at the impulse, at least in my country, of giving assistance for the sake of these other interests. Because if, if it worked well, then we really have a puzzle on our hands. It doesn't really work very well. So I think the, the path towards reducing the contradiction is clarifying that understanding. Secondly, with respect to the role of emerging powers, you asked for a few reflections on that. It's an interesting question. I'm doing a little research effort myself at Carnegie, forming a network of uh, researchers in emerging democracies uh, who are working on their own country's efforts to do democracy and rights work in their own regions, and we're trying to work together to understand this phenomenon better and to communicate within a group like that about some lessons learned. I mean, I'd say a couple of things. First, most of the major actors outside North America and Europe and in Australia and Japan on assistance are caught between a deep attachment to the norm of sovereignty. And in the case of India and Brazil and South Africa, a, a leading role in the international community and adherence to the norm of, of sovereignty and non-intervention versus the new impulse they have, which is to project their values into their regions, both as a way of distinguishing themselves from other major players within their region, and as a way of creating kind of new networks of influence in their region. And so Brazil, for example, I think is quite torn between, within the Brazilian foreign ministry, which is a preserve of traditional thinking about sovereignty and kind of an online movement and so forth, versus the new desire for Brazil to be a regional leader, and that means more than just economic cooperation now. It means the Brazilian Workers' Party, for example, now has active international cooperation with left-of-center parties in other parts of South America to say, we have a model. 
you know, we have squared the circle of a social democratic ideal with a capitalist economy. We're making it work in Brazil. You could too. And so I think this tension is an interesting one. And I think they're still working out. It's partly generational. I see it as somewhat generational within the ministries that I see, like in India and elsewhere. Interestingly, Indonesia seems a bit less caught by this tension. Because Indonesia, although back in the 1960s, played a significant role in the online movement, in the last 20 years, Indonesia has not been quite so steadfast. And Indonesia sees its interest in Asia, its relative relationship to China, for example, is you know very much about Indonesia as, as a values act and the Bali Forum, which Indonesia has put a lot of energy into and attention, is an effort by Indonesia to say, we have a distinctive profile in the region, and it's different than China. It's actually different than, than others, you know, as well, Vietnam and others. And so I think Indonesia is an interesting example of a country that's a bit less caught by that. Now, they have to go through their own learning curve about how to do this. I, was, I won't mention the country. I was having a conversation with somebody from one of those countries who's involved in this kind of assistance. And he said to me, we're not like you Americans. We don't go out and push our model of democracy the way you do so, so you know, in such an ugly fashion around the world. So then 10 minutes later, he was in the middle of describing some program. And it was all about the virtues of ex-democracy. I said, not that you would ever push your version of democracy. You know, well, oh, but that's different, he goes. Ours is good. You know. <laughs> I said, yeah, we used to think that. You know. um, so, you know, they, when people go outside their borders to work somewhere else, people are people. They know what they know, they believe in what they believe in, and they tend to think assistance is getting other people to be like you. Whereas if I've learned one thing in my career, it's assistance is getting you know, other people to take one step forward and being what they want to be. And that's probably not much like you, except for maybe having an iPhone and a couple of other things. Um, and so, just a couple of comments on that. Oscar, if you buy the book on Kindle, which I recommend. It's only eight dollars. <laughs> the price of a sandwich. I bet you can afford it. And we have a special book price out here for fifteen dollars. You're right. A lot of assistance doesn't work very well. And the attempted democratic model and the democratic republic of the Congo is, is, you know, it's been words down. It's, it's it's a tragedy of enormous proportions. Authoritarianism works equally badly. That's how they got there. We seem to remember somebody a lot like her. We used to run that country who didn't believe in democratic values and ran the country into the ground. And so it isn't that democracy is not working in Congo. Nothing's working in Congo. So that doesn't condemn the, the belief that there are some places where if you have a choice between a certain kind of regime and a more democratic one, there are good reasons to pursue a more democratic one. It does speak to the limits of the ability of international assistance to work in countries that have essentially never developed a functioning state or had a kind of weak state in the 1960s and then lost it through bad governance in the 1970s and 80s. And it's the biggest dilemma of international assistance is countries that have failed to cohere as states, what do you do? Because that's actually the single most important relationship in a society between a citizen and authority. And if you don't have authority, which is actually trying to do something other than function, you got a big problem on your hands. And the biggest problems in the world is that problem around the world when you look. And so I wouldn't damn all assistance because of its failure to solve certain problems. And I think there are, as, as Arthur was saying, there are places where maybe some small to medium sized things have actually worked better. And other places where they haven't, and we could go through and call them. It doesn't mean assistance is great, and we have all the answers, but I wouldn't throw the baby out of the bathwater. Mateo's youth programs. The two areas that have been most concerted that I've seen on, on youth programs have been um, party uh, programs where there's been a lot of effort, particularly by Northern Europeans, to build youth wings, also the US party institutes and the Germans, youth wings in parties to try to get youth to participate more. And then in a number of civil society programs that have a youth component or NGOs that are fairly youth oriented and so forth. Um, in general, it's obviously a good thing. It's been hard in the party area because parties generally are troubled and adding a youth wing is sort of like, you know, you have a sinking ship and then you build a little youth wing on it. Well, the youth wing sinks too. Um, and, you know, parties are struggling in many parts of the world, youth wing or not. And, but I think it's, it's a well-intentioned effort. Um, it's uh, in the civil society domain, actually I think that's 
but it's a huge area in the social media and interconnectedness in many ways. The participation of youth in court public life or outside their immediate circle is, is increasing exponentially in ways that aren't very organized and are different, it isn't just NGOs. And that's where a lot of the action is. And aid providers are struggling. Aid providers, you know, they move slowly. They, they have entrenched bureaucracies, they have limited budgets, and to get with the program and to move as fast as societies are changing is hard. And I see the assistance world rushing to try to keep up with these technological changes in order to keep up with the youth bulge and the youth problem, but it's a work in progress. Um, but there are issues. I mean, all major aid providers that I know are thinking about technology and youth and doing things. We could talk more about that. Arthur? Um, yeah, I, you touched on me a deep nerve, which is just this general question of can aid providers learn? Or, you know, how does learning occur and what does it look like? And as you say, why well, learn from failures? Can't you learn from successes? And, and what are some of the major obstacles to learning generally, in particular, learning from success? Um, I mean, a couple of things that I'm sure you've experienced that I, I experience a lot. One is the, the way most assistance organizations are structured, the constant change over personnel deeply undercuts learning because there's just so little institutional memory. It's taken me years to puzzle out. I'll go into a building that looks like some big, you know, sort of, you know, well-established institution. I go in, and it's kind of like a patient with Alzheimer's. You know, it sort of has a very, very dim memory of what happened two years ago. No memory of what happened four years ago. You know, and it's lost the files for beyond that. And I mean, it's really. I'm sorry. I, I had a relative recently died of Alzheimer's. I'm not making light of it. It's a horrible disease. But it. it um, Institutions are remarkably, have a remarkably difficult time accumulating anything, you know, let alone sort of learning or knowledge. But it's, it's, it's astonishing to me sometimes how little there is. Um, and I think learning from success is hard because what we do sometimes is we document success. But that's not the same as learning from success. You'll read a report on a program that says this program was actually pretty good. And it'll get put forward or put in the file, but it doesn't really say really go to the next level analytically of what, why was it so good. It's just sort of it was good. We trained this thing, good things happened, these people took this initiative, the government passed a good law that was a result of this advocacy effort, but it doesn't actually go into the why. In the same reason why learning from failure doesn't happen either, is why didn't this particular effort go on? I'm quite a believer in whatever has to happen for the results pressure, that qualitative learning at the sort of case study level is the key. I guess my work over the years, what I do is I I go to countries, I try to ask people a lot of questions, I try to organize some knowledge, I try to make some sense of it. I don't have any fancy methodology, it's not social science, you know, uh, proof. But somehow I try to reach some insights that I think are useful to people. And it's been hard for aid organizations to follow such a method because that's not very scientific. And they look like they're just puffery or they're just trying to say what great things are. They're actually almost too cautious about holding forward successes because people will doubt them and say, oh, you're just tooting your own horn, kind of. So we haven't found a happy median ground where they could say, put forward, here's five things that we think we've learned were successful, five that were failure, and so we're giving you an even balance sheet. We're confessing that we make mistakes, we're confessing we do some good things, but somehow we haven't created a culture of that. Great. Uh, I'll turn it over to Brian Brown. Uh, so uh, for a word of my My name is Anna Bowes, and you may be from Kazakhstan. I was the first principal of the Civil Service College of Kazakhstan on behalf of Her Majesty's Government of Great Britain. So, I just want to bring us down to a little lower level. You said that it's very important to get into the political and socio-economic fabric of a country. Well, I bloody well tried when I was in Kazakhstan, and I was warned off that Mr. Nazar Bayek wouldn't like it. Don't you think that this is a high risk, uh, a high risk strategy? Because we cannot often protect the citizens of the country who are helping you out. And then there's that other elephant in the room, which is especially when extractive and mining industries are concerned. Thank you. Uh, over here, then we'll come back. Yes, my 
My name is Ruby Dagger. I am a PhD candidate and instructor at uh, the School of Public Policy and Institution in Carlton. I am, um, the talk was very interesting, thank you for that. I have a, a conundrum, and, and what it is is that when we talk about corruption, we talk about a lack of democratic practices in the developing countries, we present people from the developed countries excuse me, to teach them more about democracies and elections and so forth and so forth. And then we raise the issue of the Democratic Republic of Congo, and then people say, well, it was about corruption, it was about you know, authoritarianism. Um, and we start the analysis uh, at a certain point in time, and we ignore some of the stuff that happened before, meaning donors being involved, or, or countries, developed countries being involved in the processes of these countries and leading to certain situations and supporting certain people that were authoritarian. But that's not my, my point. My point is, if we found the so-called solution for developing countries to become more democratic, because obviously their problems, as, as was indicated, uh, or what we assume are problems, as was indicated, then how do we, what, are, what is the solution to make sure that the developed countries or the donor countries are actually practicing this thing from a democratic perspective? In a sense, and I'll, I'll step back a little bit and, and, and explain something very quickly. Is that, you know, the question was posed a bit earlier, the answer was, well, the things that were not development it didn't help very much with what happened in Egypt. But we also do a lot of development-related uh, activities that are non-democratic, uh, me meaning uh, the developed world. So when I was working at SIDA, uh, we did a lot of things that we talked about good governance, and we need to promote you know, good governance, because the way we did it was not in a very democratic fashion either. Um, or what we do is we promote uh, our extractive industry uh, and put that under the guise of, of development and then say, hey, you need to improve your governance and we'll set up this, this, this agency that will help your governments better deal with that so it becomes more democratic, so the economy will, 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 will increase and so forth. So, so my, as, as, as we had suggested, is where do we go from here? Um, I, my conundrum is, okay, maybe some people believe that we found a solution for the developing world, but what's the solution for the developed world? And not a solution as in, you know, foreign policy is foreign policy, but really looking at how we've integrated foreign policy into development, and so how do we do it from a more democratic perspective? Hi, my name is Raj. I work in the area of governance. I've been working uh, for over 20 years, uh, and particularly in the more focused area of trying to strengthen external audit and internal audit in the variety of governments. And I've been working in one particular country, I won't mention which one, with the Office of the Auditor General of that country for the last 20 years. Uh, a couple of points I want to make is, first of all, the programs, the development programs, uh, the, the Fund for CEDA, the UNDP, the World Bank, they're usually three years, four years long. And the kind of change we are trying to effect through those three or four year programs takes 15, 20, 25 years. So there's a complete mismatch between what you're trying to change, the reform you're trying to bring about, and the amount of effort and time you're willing to devote to that change. The second point is that the CEDA program comes to an end in four years. There are huge lessons learned, but there is no learning to pick up on these lessons. The next program in the same institution is funded by UNDP. They bring their own team and do a diagnostic of the same problem again, without taking any note of what CEDA has done and what has been learned through the CEDA program or not learned through the CEDA program. And I've seen this happening, in my experience, in the same institution over the last 16 years. Four different donors have tried to do the same kind of change in the same institution without making any change at all. Final point I want to comment is on the political thing that you mentioned, Mr. Carruthers, earlier. The, the politics behind that change is not to provide more training to the auditors or try to change the methodology of auditing in these things. I think that's, that's technical stuff. The political change that is needed is to make the Office of the Auditor General independent of the government. And no donor wants to tackle that. The Audit Act of this country has been in draft form for the last 20 years. It's still in draft form. The Ministry of Finance and the Planning Commission will not approve that Audit Act. I'll just point this out and I'd like to see what comments you have on that. Thank you. Another question here. The second gentleman will have to have you in the next round. Merci. Uh, je vais revenir à la question initiale de Paul. Quelle est la niche pour le Canada pour le, pour le futur? Um, 
as you know, uh, Syria has been swallowed up by foreign affairs, so that will enhance the tendency for foreign affairs and from foreign affairs to say, we'll do the political analysis, thank you very much, uh, and, and the development force will just provide us with development uh, projects that, have, that fits the, the, the agenda for this country. Um, how can we do political smart way, as political smart development in that context, uh, as, a, as, a, as, as Canada? And, then, and um, just from my experience, some of the people that can do that kind of work, that being very politically smart about, about the approach, of, tend to be, and I'm, generalizing, I'm doing a generalization here, but uh, from the rights uh, community and from the humanitarian community, if you want to you know what's really going on, you talk to the ICRC people, and uh, they'll give you, uh, 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 between four walls, you get a, a superb analysis of, 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 of the key players and, the, and, their, and their motives. So how do we capture that as, uh, and, and uh, not only we have Alzheimer disease as a, as a age, age, age disease, but the, there's a few folks that see that still take pride in, uh, well, we see that we, 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 we created an RBM, which is space management. And uh, that uh, that led to really risk averse behavior. So it's actually it's bureaucratically smart to be politically dumb about that. And and so how do we turn that around moving forward? Thank you very much. One more question here, and then we'll uh, call Ruth goes in. Uh, I'm not going to go into a research associate at SIPS. I wanted to take up your uh, two comments. One that. Um, uh, political work and development is increasingly being done in the form of funding civil society groups and also your one of your closing comments that there's increasing mistrust uh, within developing countries of the whole idea of people coming in and telling them how their politics should be going. Um, when you try to square the circle of those, it means that there's, I'm thinking of a report in progress on a former Soviet socialist republic uh, on their civil society, and this report is saying, you know, we need a truly independent civil society in our country, one that is neither funded by our corrupt government, nor is funded by the international agencies. My question to you is, is this expressing a coherent desire? Is there anything to be done uh, about this expressed desire for, you know, truly independent civil society? And is there anything that aid agencies can do in response to that desire for development of civil society that is seen to be independent, not tied to donor agencies. Thank you very much. Now we will now have some answers. Let me go in reverse order this time. If you, in most countries, most developing countries, if you have a civil society that's neither funded by the government nor by international actors, you have a very small civil society. Um, and so the impulse that it sounds good, but it doesn't lead you very far in terms of what, where does that lead us, uh, in terms of supporting civil society. Um, there's a lot to say about the whole pushback against civil society, both civil society as a, actually a general idea, and then about civil society assistance, you know, restrictive NGO laws, which is, is another virus or fever that's spread in the world, is this tendency to restrict NGO <coughs> funding. Um, I mean, I'd say on the former, on civil society itself, is basically, you know, 20 some years ago in many countries that opened up away from authoritarianism, there started emerging independent sectors and a lot of foreigners began coming and saying, here's this thing called civil society, we'd like to work with it, it's different than political society and it's that we're going to engage and so forth. And really for the first 10 years or so, a lot of governments or power holders, A, they were in flux in the world, and so things were stirred up, and B, they didn't in many cases, appreciate or take all that seriously, either those organizations or the assistance that seemed fairly marginal to them. And then a series of shocks kind of hit power holders in a number of parts of the world, like the Rose Revolution and the Orange Revolution and say, in Serbia in 1999, And people began saying, whoa, these groups, something's happening in these places. And they didn't really know whether it was just a couple of NGOs or actually broader citizen protests. And it looked like the foreign hand was present in these places, which it was, although it wasn't really determined of those events. And that's only continued since then. You know, Lebanon, Kyrgyzstan, and 
in the Arab world more recently. And I think what's really happening, the, the pushback against civil society is actually a deeper issue, which is, I think many of us in, quote, established democracies think the future of politics in the 21st century is really kind of power versus citizens, or state versus society, and that political ideologies are fading a fair amount, not in every country, but in many countries, and um, that 21st century politics is really going to be kind of the state and civil society trying to be in partnership, sometimes being at odds. But a lot of country, a lot of power holders in developing countries don't really want that and feel very uncomfortable with this idea of civil society as a power sector that challenges them. And so it isn't just a pushback against civil society, it's an attempt to keep control over societies that were in flux that they got their hands back on and are trying to re-control them. So it's pretty deep. And then civil society assistance is an extension of that. People didn't take it that seriously at first. Now they're waking up, they're taking it seriously. And, and, and it's civil society assistance has gotten more sophisticated and, and it's smarter and more effective. So I do think in places where it's really difficult and it's really touching, we do have to, uh, there's no single answer depending on the country, but I do think we have to stand up more vocally and more firmly in some places and say we really care about this and we really take your measures as an anti-democratic step. It's not just a technical thing saying that NGOs have to do this and that. That does cut against free expression, this and that. In other places, we have to look at intermediate mechanisms, free granting mechanisms with local foundations where there's some consensus that's forged between power holders and outside actors who say, okay, you say you believe in some funding for civil society, we believe it, let's come together and negotiate some kinds of intermediate institutions that wouldn't be us and wouldn't be you, but we all contribute to. You know, there have been efforts like that. Um, in the Arab world, there's the Arab Human Rights Foundation, which has tried to be a re granting organization to Arab human rights organizations. And, you know, there are ways you can start to do that, but it's good stuff. But I, I think it's, you know, it's a core issue, not a <laughs> the Canadian niche, well, I'll only talk a little bit about part of it, which is the question of ministries and aid agencies and the changing world. There's a little section in the book called Enter the Ministries, because, you know, in the last 15 years, foreign ministries in Europe are doing, are, you know, aid agencies are collapsing into foreign ministries in many countries. That's the trend. It's the trend in Scandinavia where the Dutch did it, and the Danes have largely done it, and the Norwegians have done it, and the Swedes are in the process of doing it and so forth, so it's Canada is part of a larger trend, it's not some Canadian exceptionalism here. And as foreign ministries play a greater role in assistance, on the one hand, they're more comfortable with politics of development in a certain sense as they're used to dealing directly with political actors and they're used to talking politically about foreign governments and talking politics with them. And so in some sense, they're more political, but in another sense, they often personnel within them lack developmental experience of the type that leads to the kind of expertise you talk about, the on-the-ground feel, and the, you describe as a sort of really understanding what's going on in the country, understanding change in that way. They may be very good at political analysis of a certain type of who's in, who's out in the government, but they may have less experience understanding political processes of developmental change because they just haven't done that very much. And so foreign ministries are smart politically in a certain way, but inexperienced politically in another. And watching the different governments that have tried to merge the two functions, it's worked better where within the ministry there has preserved a sort of a professional specialization in development enough that people can get the benefits of being able to be more openly political in one way, but get the benefits of learning to think developmentally and being political in that other deeper way. Those that have got the worst of both worlds are really not doing well. Uh, I won't point any fingers in any countries, but they're somewhere when you're within them. They, they're very political about development in a certain sense, but they're really quite politically naive in another way, and it's it's not good. So there have been a mix of experiences. I don't want to just come from the Jewish the cameras are rolling. Um, the Norwegian government, by the way, funded this book, and so um, they're very wise politically. But, uh, um, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's an issue that has not been well studied, actually. People have tried this experiment often for domestic political reasons without really carefully studying the experience of other governments. Britain is really the last country left with a powerful independent aid agency, cabinet level aid agency. It's now the exception, not the rule. Um, so. Raj, uh, all of your comments certainly hit home with me. 
the mismatch of project length and the problem. That's what I was talking about, entrenched bureaucratic forms of work against what we know are politically smart methods. You're right, it's absurd that you create a three-year project to change a fundamental problem. It would never happen in our own country, it would happen in the country elsewhere. Um, and it's a big problem, as you say, um, the tendency, not just the black learning within institutions, but institution to institution, the tendency to repeat the mistakes. I, I'm usually a pretty calm person, but I remember kind of losing it once in Zambia with actually a Norwegian, you know, the calmest people in the world. I was meeting with Norwegian aid director in the country, and I had just come from the USA. Closing of a project on training journalists, which they had trained every journalist in Zambia. It was wonderful. And I went over to the Norwegian embassy and I met with the aid director. And he said, We had this great new idea. We're going to do journalist training. You know, and he started telling me about it, and I just lost it. I just started shrieking at the poor person. And I said, you know, have you even bothered to talk to people? You know, no, but it's different, you know, it's rights based. The area, whatever it was, you know, and, and it's just, it's astonishing at times. And it's occasionally it's gotten better in certain countries, and, but unfortunately what you described remains the pattern. And uh, the real change needs to be the underlying politics of the institution. That's what I'm talking about in this book. If the real change that needs to happen in an auditor function to make it effective is not just the technical knowledge of the political independence, we shouldn't spend 20 years providing the technical knowledge. Either we don't do that, or we begin to figure out ways, maybe we should be working with some citizen groups that are shining a light of transparency on the lack of independence and holding some seminars in the country about experiences in other countries of independent auditing. Maybe we should be supporting some journalist training to get journalists to write about auditing. Whatever it is, or, you know, but if we're not paying attention to that issue, we shouldn't be there. That's, that's just sort of my feeling. And that leads to the question about high risk. The real risk is not thinking politically. The real risk is, is doing dumb things for a long time, over and over again. That's a high risk. It's wasting people's money, people's time, and your own credibility. It's high risk if you interpret being politically smart as being politically intrusive. It's not the same thing. If I go work on a children's health program and I see that in this province, this, this governor really understands how to make an effective health program. This guy over here doesn't, he's using it as a patronage stone. Being, being politically smart is directing more money over here and then saying, you know, there's a competition between these two provinces. They're getting all the money for this one government, but you have a chance to change. And you're not being politically intrusive, you're just being politically smart. And this assumption that being more political means being more politically intrusive or offensive or that is that's where our mistake lies. That's where we have to get past it. And then I had a question about, um, quote, we found the solution. We haven't found the solution in the sense that I don't think, you know, U.S. or Canadian-style democracy is necessarily the solution tomorrow in this country or that country. When I say we found the solution, the solution is to integrate all elements of change in a country, political, social, economic, cultural, and to think, understand it, to have our actions meet the sophistication of the problems we're dealing with. The solution is only the approach. If we go around and say, we have the solution, and we're going to use the phrase teaching about democracy, I'm going to see you. Um, uh, there you are. Thank you. I didn't mean by we found the solution meaning we have the end product, everyone should do that immediately. What I mean by we finally cut across the barrier that divided the assistance world into separate parts and pretended they could be pursued independently. Great. Uh, now, Isabel can be pushing some of the room pretty soon, so we're going to have to restrict to just three questions. So, two gentlemen that are up right now, and the gentleman that I know, well, then you're locked. You've got three questions. So. Thanks. My name is Derek Conrad. And I'm a former politician who had the misfortune to uh, be critic for Indian Affairs here in Canada. <laughs> also a development issue, believe me. <laughs> I read the book you mentioned about uh, why nations fail when I was in uh, Europe last year during elections and uh, read about leadership. And I was thinking of your intrinsic and instrumental or mechanical approaches to things, uh, the instrument being things, I suppose, like knowledge, infrastructure, economics, rule of law, markets, that kind of thing. But they seem to be able to be perverted from the purposes. And uh, the other value of the intrinsic here seem to me to include things like integrity, high aspirations for the people being governed, uh, ability, a sense of self-sacrifice, that this, I'm not in it for myself. Um, self-sacrifice, yeah. Courage, things like that. 
do we teach those kinds of things? How do we teach those kinds of things? Which I think are kind of critical to getting anywhere. And who teaches these things? Are programs in place to do such things? And I'd like Paul to answer that question as well from the Canadian perspective because he said he wanted some questions on how Canada gets involved. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Uh, my name is Houston, English model. Uh, welcome to Ottawa, by the way. Still warm. Um, three comments. One would be the solution that I mentioned. I think the solution to me seems like it's only one way from the West to the developed countries. We have not seen anything that the solution that is just holistic. Let us get together dialogue between the recipient countries and the donors countries. What is the way forward towards the democratic process? A second point, um, I call it a copy-paste of Western democracy in Africa or the third world. All the Western, uh, the Western democracies, okay, do the election. And then they do the election and then we create more Mugabe's, uh, South Korea and uh, so forth. But really, maybe we need to think twice before we say, okay, let's do A, B, C, transparency and uh, all that I've mentioned, the magic words. Maybe we need to think deeper and study what is this governing system in Africa, in the third world countries. How do they govern themselves before 1960s or 1950s? And then we see what are the good components of the good governance and what are the components of the Western democracy, good one. And then let's okay, bring the two together, maybe that will be the model that can enable each country can govern itself. So what we have seen all this, Western democracy copy paste. It never worked, and it created confusion that you have saved between the confusion between the, uh, the development experts and the politicians. The same thing, African leaders are uh, struggling with the confusion between the Western democracy and the local system that actually existed before the Western democracy. Uh, maybe we should do the deeper study there. Um, if there is a system of governance exists in the third world countries, maybe we need to build on it based on the capabilities, theories of how much things. And if not, let's find another way. Thank you. Hi, my name is Tamri Khan, and I'm um, sort of representing the recipient side of development assistance. And I just wanted to bring up this uh, issue of accountability um, that I find very interesting coming from where I do come from. Um, and that's, I think a lot of what the international development community does and manage to quote unquote get away with with its programs is because its own people are very less aware of what development assistance really is. Um, and I think public awareness about this issue in the West is negligible. So if you're talking about accountability and about taxpayers' money's money being used to you know, help other people in other countries, most people in your own countries don't even know what it is because development assistance is a national issue and priority is on a much lower scale than a lot of other issues, for instance. So only when you know, people find out that their taxpaying uh, dollars are being used for to assist you know, a corrupt military and another government that everybody wakes up and starts making a noise. But by and large, people in the West don't have much idea of what is being done by these agencies. I mean, I've walked down the street in Canada and asked people, you know, see that, they're like, see that? You know, a lot of people, really, what does it stand for? I think that's a big issue of accountability in Western donor nations that their own people don't really care or are interested much or know much about development assistance, which is why it perpetuates um, this system around the rest of the world. Great. Thanks. And that would be the last set of questions. And of course, your time is drawing short, so I can answer that. And we'll to <laughs> a little bit of a question for you there. And I want to come back to the question of uh, Canadian nations. Your mind and others. So I'll just be brief because these were all thoughtful comments that I agree with. Them. Um, the last one, it's true. Uh, accountability of, of aid is it's very low within our own societies, except in a very loose general sense in which gets attacked without much thought. But then it's also often quite unaccountable in the countries that gets carried out. And I don't think that it's not that it's sinister, but that lack of difficulty of holding it to clear account does breed a lot of problems and intensity to repeat mistakes, so I, I agree with you. And this idea of combining elements of African governance with Western democracy, ideally if you're trying to 
work in a, in a fashion that genuinely takes the local context into account and understand that the people you will start to do that. The, the question of what are non-Western forms of governance that are valuable that should be sort of integrated into Western democracy, it's surprising in some ways, 30, 40, 50 years into this century, we haven't thought it through all that well, and it's sometimes an excuse for just doing bad things politically and saying that's just how we do them in our culture, and other times just hasn't had a chance to flourish. I'm doing a project with a colleague of mine on what is the real meaning of non-Western democracy. Because actually when I give talks to non-Western audiences, usually the first comment or question is somebody like yourself who stands up and says, we want democracy, but we don't necessarily want your democracy. And so then I usually say to them, describe what you want. I'm just curious, like what, is it, what does it look like? And often I'm surprised they know what they don't like about my model or what they imagine my model to be, but they haven't surprisingly thought through that much in many cases. And often they don't want things that I don't think are elements of the political system. They say, well, we don't want, um, if it's maybe a conservative Muslim country, we don't want the way women act in your society. We don't want that in our society. So, well, you know, it used to be in Western democracies, they didn't have this kind of independence or freedom either. So that isn't necessarily intrinsic to Western democracy. That's a choice, a social choice that's been made, turning into a political choice. Or they say, we don't want your savage capitalism. I'll say, well, there are Western democracies that have a different kind of capitalism. And you sort of sort out, they don't want certain social things, they don't want certain economic things. And then I'll say, would you like everyone to be treated fairly before the law? Would you like the government not to be corrupt? Would you like the right to be able to speak out without getting thrown into jail? And usually, you know, it sounds good. And they'll say, tell me more. What, what else is in your democracy that I don't understand? And it's an undeveloped conversation, surprisingly. Uh, or it's a conversation so laden with, with hostility and skepticism, I would say, that it often hasn't advanced much. That leads to what you say about teaching and cultural values. I usually cringe a bit at the word teaching. I don't think good assistance is mostly about teaching. Good assistance is, a, is about trying to help other people figure out how to do what they, they want to do. And that isn't really teaching so much as facilitating, in some cases, empowering. And teaching can be a way of doing that, but the word teach is a little that I, I like very much the comment the gentleman over here made, that we really need to sit down together and work through these things. I mean, aid is ending in the deeper sense that the idea that there's a set of countries that have solved problems and a set of countries that have problems is no longer credible. All countries have a lot of problems. At least I'm coming from a country that's ripe with political problems, serious problems in its function of political democracy. And the idea that we, we are going abroad to teach is simply not credible. We, we may have certain experiences and certain resources and the ability to bring people from elsewhere together, but we're certainly not going to be teaching our model. And if we are, then we're, we're kidding ourselves. On the Canadian list, that leads to the segue. Last thing I'd like to say, a number of Canadians say to me, Canadian democracy is unique in various ways, and surely Canadian democracy has a special place. I get a little nervous when I hear that, um, because it isn't Canadian democracy that necessarily is what's going to be best for Malawi next year or best for Mongolia. On the other hand, if Canadians have learned some things about what they mean is we've learned something about reconciling different cultural views within one political system. We've learned something about how politicians engage publics at a time of austerity. Whatever it is, that, that's okay. But if it, sometimes it sounds a bit like there's a system or a model that we need to lift up and start dropping on people elsewhere. It doesn't work any better for Canadian democracy than for U.S. or Brazilian and elsewhere. So I think Canada's unique place it is true about the lack of geopolitical baggage, the values of tolerance and pluralism and other things that are, that are so notable, but it, I'd be wary about starting with the idea that there's a Canadian model that is going to be good for the world. Now I get to sit here all day, I really enjoy it. <laughs> Thank you for coming.